So now we are going to go into something called ultra wideband. This is a whole new technology. Before, I, so, so the thing about UWB, ultra wideband, UWB, is the, to understand the time domain and the frequency domain. If I have a sine wave in the time domain, what does it look like in the frequency domain? Impulse. Impulse. Everybody understand that? Is that all the power is concentrated in one frequency. So this is a power on the y-axis, frequency on the x-axis, it will look like an impulse. On the time axis, this is the time and this is the power, it is a sine wave. Same thing if you do the other way around, these basically are symmetric. If you have an impulse in the time wave, it will be a constant function in the frequency domain. We can call it a unit function. Unit function is the one that starts at zero and remains constant to infinity. And um, the so the impulse becomes a frequency, it becomes in the time domain becomes a constant power in the frequency domain. The main question is what is the height of this power? Well, it depends upon the height of the impulse. If you, and what is an impulse? So, suppose I, I make a big noise, boom, boom, that's an impulse. As I put a lot of energy in a, in a microsecond. Right? So, basically, if you don't make that big noise, if you make a very little noise, it's a still a noise and it's still an impulse and it's still some energy is transmitted in the frequency domain. This is very important to understand. Time domain and frequency domain. So, some people realized that if we want to, if this is the case, then we can send some impulses such that in the frequency domain, they will become power which is very little, although it is on every frequency. And it is so little that it is below the noise level. So, you won't even hear it in the frequency domain. In the time domain, you will. But in the frequency domain, it will be very low power. And so that became interesting because now we can use all the spectrum which is used by the world. Let's say you have a plane, you know, plane is going and they have reserved a spectrum for some frequency, but they are allowed to have some noise, right? That below this is noise. In that noise level, you can just send your information. Right? So, for example, when the computers are designed, they are certified by FCC and there must be an FCC certification somewhere in the back. What that means is that if noise level is below the noise level set by FCC. Right? Now, I can design another equipment that produces radiation which is below the noise level and FCC will say, yeah, this is fine. And now it can use any frequency because it is just generating noise, nothing else. And with that noise, we can do communication and some very high speed communication with very high data rate. So that's the whole idea of ultra wide band. Ultra wide band. It is not just limited to a small frequency domain, it's ultra wide. And so this ultra wide band basically uses maybe from, let's say from 1 megahertz to 1 gigahertz or one, 10 gigahertz or something, very wide band, okay? And, but it keeps the level, power level below the noise level. So, here is a picture. When you use a cell phone, you are sending about 0 dB, 0 dBm per megahertz, right? 0 dBm is 1 milliwatt, whatever, right? And minus 40 dBm is the noise level, which is set by FCC part 15, minus 41.3 to be exact. So, anything below minus 41.3 dBm per megahertz is considered noise. Okay? No working device should be affected by it because you should design the working devices so they, they are not affected by the noise. So, you put your CRC, your error correction, everything else. So that if, the, if there is a noise like that, it will be taken care of. And so if you communicate below this minus 41.3, then you are legal. I mean, 
not so far. I mean, basically, you could be you could be using it without disturbing anybody. So, so this is FCC rule. This restrict the maximum noise generated by wireless devices to minus forty. It is possible to generate very short sub nanosecond pulses that have a spectrum below the noise level. Okay, so you can get gigabits per second using ten gigahertz spectrum. And FCC said, yeah, that's fine in two thousand two. In 2002, FCC said it's okay, no problem. You can do that. And so people started working on this standard at IEEE, and um, and so that can be used for very high speed communication over a short distance because there is not much power, so it cannot go <coughs> very far, but it can be very high speed. And UWB can see through trees, underground collision, and so on and so forth through the ball motion detection, and so on and so forth. So anyway, so interesting thing is because it is not just one frequency. You know, it has some low frequency, some high frequency, and so on and so forth. The low frequencies can go through the walls much better than the high frequency. You know, the light cannot go through this wall, but 2.4 gigahertz can. And if you have below that, it may be one megahertz that can go even more. So UWB has many applications. Okay. And let me tell you some applications that. Um, so we wrote a paper. Actually, so one of the students attending the same course here, five, ten years ago, five, six years ago, wrote a paper on UWB. At that time, it was a novelty. Now it is in every book. So it's not a novelty. And so I got a call from somebody saying that, oh, we want to use this in our medical application. And the application is basically you can look inside the, your stomach. You can do baby scanning or whatever they do um, things. You know, or disease scanning, anything using UWB. Okay, so UWB is very, very. I mean, it, it is position tracking, and you can measure things distances up to few millimeters and centimeters. So, if you have some very high value assets, suppose you have a diamond behind this wall, you can monitor using UWB. It has not moved. But if somebody steals it, you will know. So, there are many applications of this. But in network, yeah. Yeah, in zero, one. I think it was the zero dBm. It's a limit for. Minimum power that we cannot possess. Okay, so what this says is zero dBm per megahertz. <clears throat> and um, now this question is: Is this the real number for the cell phones? I don't know. I I think the cell phone number is much more complicated than zero. Zero is we are taking just as as a reference. But because if you are in one gigahertz band, there is some power limit. If you are in three gigahertz band, there is some power limit. If you are sixty gigahertz band, is, you know, so there is all kinds of limits which are very complicated. So zero is just the reference point. I, I mean, uh, it's it's a limit for what? It's a, it's a oh, so this thing is okay. So what it is saying is in the normal communication. Okay, so there is a limit for every transmission that you know is that you cannot just start you know putting lot of wireless radiation here. Otherwise, it will be microwave, right? The maximum power level, yeah. Power level that you can use in, uh, in cellular communication, let's say, um, and and cell is just simply an example. I mean, in any communication, there is a maximum power limit, which is generally very small. Otherwise, you know, you know, microwave uses the same two point four gigahertz. They run on the same frequency that we are using for Wi-Fi, but they are sending, as I said before, they, they are using seven hundred kilo, seven um, hundred watts of power, as opposed to we are using. Seven milliwatts of power. That's the only difference. <coughs> so, <laughs> right? So, so anyway, so that is just what he's saying is that let's say normal communication uses zero minus forty. Minus forty means minus ten raised to four. Sorry, ten raised to minus four means one ten thousandth of that is noise. Right? What is minus forty dBm? You know, if you convert into ratios, it will be ten raised to minus four. Every power of ten becomes ten dB, ten dB, twenty dB, thirty dB, and we just get used to thinking like that. So that thirty dB, I know, is thousand, and forty dB is ten thousand. All right. So this is how we. Uh, so, so this is how they started doing it. They said, if I generate a pulse like this. Depending upon how wide the pulse is, the energy will be distributed. If you make it very narrow, the energy will be distributed to very high in the frequency domain, very very wide band. 
frequency domain so it will be much lower on the other hand if i make it wider then the frequency is will be concentrated in a smaller this one it won't be ultra wide and the power will be large and it won't be noise anymore so to to keep under the noise level what we do is we generate pulses which are very thin right which means they, they are very narrow and then how do we do zeros and one so we can say well this is a one and this is a zero this is just 180 degree phase and so the phase can tell what is whether it is zero or one and the pulses can be as narrow as possible so so when the semiconductor switches be started becoming available then people were able to do this previously they were not able to do this the semiconductors we can generate pulses which are in picoseconds very narrow pulses so the pulse width is 25 to 400 picoseconds and now we can modulate them using amplitude polarity or position position amplitude or polarity position means if the pulse is on this corner it is a zero if it is on this corner it is a one so basically you know we can have four positions with two bits or one posi two positions with one bit that is position modulation amplitude modulation is how high the pulse is and the polarity modulation is like shown here this is positive and this is negative by the way um, that polarity is also phase 180 degree is becomes that right so polarity modulated now if you have 0 0.25 nanosecond which is like 250 picosecond impulse you can generate 400 billion pulses per second and that can be several hundred megabits per second so one group in 802.15.4 decided to use uwb based communication for short distance and um, using pulse position and binary phase shift keying modulation all right now binary phase shift we know what that means is basically phase depends upon the value of the symbol if you have a sending zero zero so you can just like qualm you can have multiple bits and then you can do the phase <coughs> and then you can also use the position as well I have another bit so anyway uwb the advantage is that very low energy consumption you don't spend too much energy line of sight is not required it goes to the walls sub centimeter resolution allows precise motion detection so if if things are moving even by my millimeter or centimeter you can measure it with this pulse width much smaller than the path delay so multi path is very easily resolved so basically what happens is these are in nanoseconds and if i went there and came back and if i went there and came back the two paths will be different very different compared to the width of the pulse so we can figure out you know that this uh, different paths so it is easy to resolve multi path and therefore we can use multi path to advantage and difficult to intercept because all noise nobody can figure out that is even happening all digital logic so very low cost and very small 4.5 millimeter square so you know how much is in millimeter half of a centimeter so this is probably 12 millimeter width right there so one third of the stems thickness so this is very good and um, there were two groups one was uh, saying that we should use direct sequence you know what that means is they take your bits and then you convert them into using a code into chips and then you put that into the into the coding basically into the pulses so this is using CL CDMA and um, and then and so this they felt that it was good for the body area network so if you have something in the body or around the body you can use this one the other group actually I, I have deleted some of the slides so that they, let me just tell you what really happened this says that this is the scheme used in 8.15.4 I think what exactly happened was there were two groups one was using this direct sequence CDMA and other group was using OFDMA OFDM and the two groups fought and fought and fought and then both were disbanded so I don't think it is being used okay but it might have come back I don't know so so that was the end of um, UWB 
but I thought it was good to know what is going on. So I, I, I put the slides in because even though it is not being used, it's good to know the concept. Five, six years ago when I taught this class and when the other guy wrote the paper, um, that time this was still in debate. So 15.4 was discussing which one to use between the two. And then the story was that one of the groups went to some other standards bodies like ECMA or something and got it standardized there. And this group went to some other body and got it standardized there. But um, neither one actually is being used um, in the 15.4. But this could be something to be checked. Okay, all right, all right, let's see. You are saying, how do you convert pulses to megabits yeah. per second? Okay, all right. So what you do is, you take the bits and take a number of bits to make a symbol. So you maybe take four bits to make one symbol. Now those symbols, now you have to code, right? So before you code, you decide whether this symbol will be coded using CDMA or OFDM or whatever, right? So let's say we do CDMA and CDMA says that four bits will become 10 chips. Okay, now you have chips, right? Now you decide how these, each chip is going to be coded, right? A straightforward method could be that each chip becomes one pulse, okay? Or it could be that you take two chips and make a pulse with a different position. So there is lots of possibilities. There are many levels where from the starting from the bits getting to the pulses, there is a coding of many different kinds and then modulation. Yeah, so that's why I didn't put exact formula there and it's not very easy to say that why 100, why not 200? Well, you can get 200 too. I mean, so the thing is, but so that's just hundreds megabits, very approximate because a lot of details there. Okay. Alex, UWB is um, actually there was a lot of talk at, at that time, actually six years ago, but um, now people have found better ways of doing high speed, 60 gigahertz is there. So some of this has gone away. 60 gigahertz is right now you know, kind of thing that we will use for gigabits and so on and so forth. The last slide, 15.4e. So 15.4 has several ABCD so, so on and so forth. And I left the 15.4e slide here because it is, um, it does some things that we might need in Zigbee or you know wireless art or something. So that's why because there are more standards than we can talk in one semester, right? So 4E. Okay. So 4E. Um, so this is in, in this one you do a deterministic operation with the pre-sine slots. So everybody gets a slot and you just speak in your slot. So that's basically it, is that you know you come up whenever your slot comes up, you say something and then you know you go away. So that is low latency deterministic operation. Channel adaptation, different channels used by different nodes for contention free period. And so you remember the contention free and the contention access cap and CFP. So in the contention free period, multiple people could talk because they are talking talking on the different channel. Okay, then it also allows time slotted channel hopping. So higher layers coordinate the slot allocation along with its frequency. So now if different people can use different channels, the question is can one person use different channels and that is also allowed, that is channel hopping. Is that you are transmitting on channel 1 and the next time you might transmit on channel 3 and then next time you channel 53 and so on and so forth. You could do the channel hopping good for industrial environment. Each device can select its listening channel. Now, so if you are going to hop all around and people are going to use different channels, then the question is which one should I be listening to? So here they said the listener decides the channel. Okay. And so I am only listening to channel 5, let's say. And if you want to talk to me, then come and talk, then transmit on channel 5. So you have to find out where there is talking. So basically, each device selects its listening channel. And the transmitter and receiver coordinate their cycles so that you know you talk on the listening channel. Transmit only when requested by the receiver. 
and of course because the receiver is listening two people cannot talk at the same time to the receiver and uh, so basically <coughs> you ask just like RTS request to send and then you get okay I like you're clear to send so that's the kind of operation which happens in 15.4e and uh, the reason I talked about this 15.4e is because I think one of the standards in the list with that we saw before uses 15.4e any question about this this is kind of very rough uh, indication of what happens in 15.4e <coughs> that instead of doing CSMA CA, we just do fixed allocation. Okay, so this is only good for very small number of nodes. And that brings us to the end of this module. Five key messages that IoT fueled initially by smart grid is resulting in many competing protocols, Bluetooth, smart, Zigbee, etc, etc. 15.4 is a low data rate wireless personal area network. Um, phi and make layer used by many IoT protocols, Zigbee and wireless are, those are the two very common ones. And then main thing I wanted to say here was that you need to know that there is an FFD, there is an RFD and there is a coordinator and then there is a cluster, mesh and star etc etc you know. <laughs> then there are the slotted and unslotted version of the CSMACA and then we also saw the deterministic transmission. And finally we talked about UWB. Okay, so these are the few, few new concepts we saw, UWB, um, FFD, RFD, slotted and unslotted operation. So there is no homework, which is okay, alright, Wikipedia is there, that's it. Then we go to the next lecture.